how many of you have attended uh, uh, the any session uh, held by USGI before? Uh, thank you, thank you. That means that the problem we, we do have a new uh, attendant, uh, so that probably I need to explain a little bit about USGI. USGI is US Japan Research Institute. Uh, established by uh, originally five, but now uh, nine universities, leading universities in Japan, uh, including my own Uchimaka uh, University. And, uh, uh, we, uh, Mr. Kobashi is the head of our office uh, at Washington, D.C. So we have uh, office at Washington, Washington D.C. Our uh, the um, uh, most important goal here is to uh, establish uh, the second track uh, friendship between Japan and the United States, and, uh, especially with the uh, people of Washington D.C. We are uh, very much looking forward to uh, discussing about uh, any uh, global issues uh, related to especially Japan and the United States. So much for US, uh, description, description about USGI itself. Uh, uh, basically, each university has uh, their own USGI-related project. Uh, Ritsumeika University uh, started uh, working on anti-globalism. Based on that uh, research project, uh, we are holding uh, today's session. Simply put, uh, globalization means uh, free flow of money, goods, and services, information, and people, which uh, through which we enhance integration on the earth. Uh, especially since last year, the world, uh, however, has been, uh, has seen a visible rise of anti-immigration uh, sentiment represented by your president and uh, Brexit. Uh, naturally, we uh, came to uh, question uh, whether we are headed uh, toward the era of anti-globalism. But uh, uh, this uh, New Year's Day, uh, I had a meeting with uh, uh, Professor Kisha uh, Mahabani, a dean of Lee Kuan Yew School of, of uh, National University of Singapore, and along with many others. He boast, boasted uh, there, there, are, there is no sim uh, similar anti globalism phenomenon in Asia. And uh, my, of course, first impression was, uh, I, I, I was not that much sure, I'm not sure. So, uh, if so, anti-globalism is an isolated phenomenon in some regions. But we cannot be uh, that much sure unless we examine closely about, uh, for example, cases in Asia. Uh, our two uh, China specialists, uh, discuss uh, the future problems of China uh, to partially answer the above obvious uh, global question of anti-globalism. Uh, ironically enough, uh, it seems that the US and China switched uh, its uh, respective position, for example, in terms of trade. Now Chinese government at least uh, sounds more free trader, uh, while the US looks uh, more protectionist. So. Uh, if so, how about the uh, attitude of China toward refugees? Uh, that's the question we pose here, and uh, we try to uh, clarify uh, that question. Uh, I have two uh, uh, young and senior uh, China specialists uh, sitting next to me. And uh, sitting next to me is uh, Miwa Hirono. Uh, Professor Hirono is a uh, colleague of mine. Uh, we uh, invited to our university a few years ago, 
she has uh, graduated. Uh, she has won uh, her PhD at the Australian National University and taught at uh, Nottingham uh, UK University uh, for a few years. And uh, uh, sitting next to uh, Miwa is an uh, old, old friend of mine, Kang Shen Tsao. He's a uh, 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 I think many of you know, know Chen that he's a famous uh, Chinese specialist in Washington, D.C., pretty much established in China. Specialist. He teaches uh, China uh, along with uh, entire East Asian international relations at American University. Actually, he's an expert of Japan as well. So uh, he obviously uh, able to compare some uh, In, in, uh, the, in Japan, China, in, in many um, ways. Uh, so much for my introduction. I'd like to invite uh, Miwa to start uh, her own presentation. Uh, so Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming here and uh, uh, share, uh, let me share some of the research findings that uh, I've been working on uh, for the last uh, uh, several months. My name is Miwa Hirano and thanks very much for your kind introduction uh, about me. So um, this is a uh, very much work in progress paper. Uh, I've really just started working on uh, China refugee uh, issues. Uh, I haven't done much field work on it. I have been working on China's sort of other sides of uh, other kinds of global affairs, which is peacekeeping operations and humanitarian assistance. So this is a very new area, although the kind of decision-making process uh, or factors that uh, uh, sort of lead to a particular decision that Chinese government makes is somewhat similar uh, to uh, some of the issues that I've been working on, particularly humanitarian assistance. So I do apply some of the uh, uh, analytical framework that I developed in the past to this new uh, issue that I'm working on, refugee issues. So um, as Professor Nakatsuji mentioned, uh, what we have witnessed in the US and UK uh, in 2016 and this year um, it seems to be a reflection of the rise of anti-globalism. So un uh, defining anti-globalism is actually a really difficult thing. And uh, we're working on this project and we've been struggling with the definition. But it's sort of broad sense of things. Um, it is something about the sense of opposition to free flows of, and influences of capital and goods, information and ideas and people and forces. One of the most important examples of anti-globalism can be seen in how one responds to refugee crisis. I don't have to really talk about the so-called Muslim ban, uh, a wall between US and Mexico, and the link between the anti-immigration sentiment and Brexit. These so-called policies are what the respected government is pursuing, but Mr. Trump and Brexit were um, voted voted in because such anti-globalism is closely linked to people's perceptions, emotions, and angers. People are generally concerned about social stability, which they think is caused uh, uh, um, affected adversely by the influx of refugees and immigrants. So against this background, when you look at anti-globalism in Asia, It'd be really interesting to find out how anti-globalism manifests itself and who are the main supporters for such an idea. When we talk about refugee issues in Asia, can we see a phenomenon similar to the United States or the United Kingdom in which people's sentiment and perceptions are the driving force of anti-globalism? And um, what I've found so far, just to give you the gist of my finding, is that the refugee responses of the Chinese government mainly derived from the state policy 
In fact, it's a foreign policy between China and neighboring countries rather than people's sentiments. So therefore, I put this as the um, sort of title of my uh, presentation, state-led anti-globalism rather than society-led anti-globalism. And so uh, let me just uh, uh, explain more detail about what I'm thinking here uh, by talking about more detail about uh, uh, China's refugee policy. So um, initially, I thought uh, China, we, we do have an impression that China has been not particularly welcoming refugees. We do have, I, I, I think, um, I guess many of us like, um, look at some media reports about how China responds to North Korean refugees, and all the reports we hear is that China is re repatriating refugees to North Korea and all that sort of stuff. So the image uh, we might have is a very kind of hardcore China that tends to repatriate all sorts of refugees, very refugee unfriendly country. And I also thought that the impression we have, we might have, is that we really China really wants to secure the social stability, one of the core national interests that the Chinese government actually defines, make sure that so, uh, social stability is intact. That's the kind of impression that I had at least, and I think many of you might share my feeling. But then actually, when I looked into some uh, Ch Chinese responses to refugees, that wasn't really true. So I just want to introduce uh, some of the refugee uh, issues to you. Now, before that, uh, let me just uh, explain uh, the central questions that um, this paper deals with, and uh, central question. So, Pretty simple questions, but a very difficult question indeed. How has China approached international conventions and institutions relating to refugee and asylum seekers and the major influx of refugees? Why has it approached them in the ways it has? What explains China's refugee policies? Um, so, um, The how and why questions are both very important because they are some, there are some major gaps in the study of China's refugee policies. These central questions are designed to fill the gaps in the literature as follows. The first is a lack of studies into China's refugee policy. The literature focuses on refugee problems from North Korea and very few studies, if any, deal with other refugee issues that China has faced let alone an historical investigation of what China has faced so far or comparative studies of various refugee issues China has faced. Further, uh, very little research, if any, attempt to explain the variation of China's refugee policy. In fact, there was one state in history that China has received, China received a lot of refugees. I'll tell you in a, uh, more in a minute. The second gap in the literature is that we have very few studies into China's globalism and anti-globalism in a transnational context. The majority of studies focus on either global phenomena such as UN politics and China's relations with WTO, or domestic phenomena such as human rights issues and internet censorship. So it seems that China, as Professor Nakatsuji said, China seems to be a vanguard of uh, globalism now. That China, uh, did you hear the um, speech that the President Xi Jinping, um, Xi Jinping made in Davos in January this year? He was really trying to protect the global globalism in economic affairs. And that was in face of Mr. Trump, who was trying to commit himself to uh, protectionism. So it's such an irony that the capitalist state is now retreating from the global, global uh, globalism, whereas the communist state is trying to protect globalism. So what I want to say is that China seems to be very keen on globalism. In fact, the globalization is one of the key uh, foreign policy pillars that the Chinese government defines. So it is very keen. At the same time, we do hear these um, reports that China, um, Liu Xiaobo, uh, all those uh, great firewall, um, lots of stuff that it seems to be very um, sort of uh, uh, opposing to the idea of free, free, free flow of information and ideas and people's movement. 
So we have this sort of uh, contradiction between international phenomena and domestic phenomena. Refugee is a very interesting issue because it's a transnational. It starts from global aff affairs, but then once refugees cross the country, cross the border, it becomes a domestic issue. It is a transnational issue. How do China respond to such a transnational issue? How does that sort of China's response to transnational issues relate to globalism and anti-globalism? So that's the key gap, the second gap I mentioned, um, that uh, there is not much research on China's uh, relations with anti and glo globalism and anti-globalism in a transnational context. So these questions are designed to fill these gaps in the literature. Now, uh, one of the, the first question has the words, uh, phrase, the major influx of refugees. And just to show you, um, I chose these so-called major influx of refugees as an empirical cases. People from Indochina in the 70s and 80s, people from North Korea, so North Korea, uh, and people from Myanmar. Now, notice I use the word people rather than refugees. And that's because the Chinese government doesn't recognize them as refugees. A bit of an ex exception for Indo-Chinese, but um, they, they are people. And then there's different kinds of categories, and I'll show you what it is. These are the kind of different categories that China uses to describe what we call refugees. So uh, North Koreans are always uh, talk to a uh, escapee, North Korean escapee. They're not refugees. They're escapees. And uh, also in the Chinese um, refugees, they are called Gui Chiao, um, returning. And Chiao is a Hua Chiao, it's a uh, sort of a Chinese, uh, overseas Chinese. So overseas Chinese who return to China is what they call in the in Chinese, um, uh, what, with the, what they, how they describe in the Chinese refugees. Um, also, uh, I actually didn't put this word, but another word called uh, uh, Bianmin, which is peripheral people. This is the word that they use to describe people from Myanmar. Right? So one of the interesting things about refugee issue is that who are refugees when China doesn't recognize them as refugees? Um, so I just want you to be aware that there are different categories and what we think of the refugee issue may not necessarily be a refugee issue from the Chinese perspective. The key example here is, of course, the North Korean escapees. Okay, so that's just a sort of uh, um, clarification of wording. Um, okay, so how do we exactly do this research on how has China approached international conventions and institutions relating to refugees and a major influx of refugees, and why has it done so? So I established an analytical framework um, based on the literature of international relations theories and Chinese foreign policy. Uh, because as I said, there is not much research on Chinese refugee policy, so I just have to create this analytical framework based on relevant literature. And I kind of came up with eight different hypotheses, if you like, um, that the possible reasons why China accepted or didn't accept refugees. And I think these eight are possible reasons. And one of the interesting things about this, at the beginning when I started this research, I thought, okay, so social stability as a reason why China, uh, China sort of rejects refugees. Etc. So I designated each element as a reason for accepting or not accepting refugees. But in fact, as I proceed uh, in my research, I realized that one particular issue will lead to either accepting or not accepting refugees. And I hope by the end of my presentation that you, I hope you know what I mean better. But, so I don't really categorize this according to whether or not China accepts um, refugees, or more sort of more I sort of categorize it more sort of thematically. So the first three are sort of from realist perspective, really about the uh, Chinese sort of uh, power um, and capability. So social stability as part of China's core national interest. The Chinese um, white paper 
uh, published in 2011, called uh, Peaceful Rise, China's Peaceful Rise, define what are China's core interests. And one of them is social stability. So the reason I assume that um, China didn't accept North Koreans, for example, is to protect social stability. That's the first point. Second point, bilateral relations with refugee producing states. So lots of refugee issues that uh, China is actually facing are coming from bordering states. Okay, uh, these days we do have uh, refugee issues in the Middle East and Africa, but the majority of people that China seriously has to face, face with are bordering countries. So China's relations with North Korea, for example, China's relations with Myanmar, define the kind of approach that China takes to refugee issues. That's the second hypothesis. The third hypothesis is more of a sort of state capability issue, a lack of or existence of state capability to protect borders. China is a huge country. If you have traveled uh, around the border regions like I had, um, you know how much forest and, uh, and how porous the borders actually are. Some of the uh, border points are really secure, but that's not necessarily the point that people in the border regions move around. So uh, state capability, uh, how much state can actually control borders uh, actually matters here. Now, from a liberal and the constructivist perspective, international socialization. So there is this uh, international uh, convention and treaty about refugees. And as China grows and China uh, sort of participates in international regimes, China is also uh, befriend itself to international regimes, in this case, international refugee regime. And fifth, China claims itself as a responsible state. So China's sort of treatment of refugee, or friendly uh, acceptance of refugee, is a sort of sign of China becoming a responsible state. Lots of question marks, lots of sort of um, Okay, and the final three is from a domestic or sociological considerations. Um, six, helping ethnic Chinese. If refugees are actually ethnic Chinese, they help. Seven, cultural and economic security. I put cultural, but basically I'm talking about the kind of idea that you want to protect a, a kind of homogenous society, the Chinese nation, if you like. We don't want someone different. Economic security. If refugees come, the job will go. The kind of discussion we've seen in the States and the UK. Is it happening in China? And finally, humanitarian consideration. So those are the eight different sort of um, um, hypotheses, if you like. And what I do after this is to look at how China responded to the international refugee regime, as a first example, and uh, into China refugees, Myanmar refugees, and North Korean refugees. And look at why, how China respond to those and why they did so. And then after that, I'll come to a beautiful uh, table that I came up with. So, um, oh, yes, and sorry, before I go ahead, let me just um, raise two important facts. Because China's refugee policies are not really well known, I thought it would be really interesting to show you some data and uh, graphs. So first of all, as I said, China is actually a refugee accepting country, despite what you might think. There you go. It's a bit old graph. It's 2004. I'm sure you can't read it. Um, but basically, this is top 10 countries by number of refugees. Yes. And from the bottom, this is at the moment of the uh, 2004. At the bottom, it's Jordan. So from the bottom, Jordan, uh, Palestine, Iran, Pakistan, Germany, Tanzania, Syria, United States, Lebanon, and China. At the time of 2004, China was the 10th biggest accepting country of refugees. I was really surprised when I saw it. Where did that come from? Where do they actually live? And where do the refugees actually come from? And uh, given the uh, current refugee crisis, I just thought I need to update this data. I looked at uh, UNHCR's report, 
And uh, sorry again, this is so hard to read, I'm sure. But um, this is the current, well, 2016 uh, world ranking of refugee acceptance. I put yellow for the countries that you might be familiar with. And across this, in fact, China stays here. I don't have time to explain all the details, but China uh, in 2016, number 21 country in uh, refugee acceptance. Uh, top is Turkey, Pakistan, South Africa, Lebanon, Germany, etc., etc. United States, France, China, and United Kingdom. Very interesting, isn't it? There are um, lots of uh, other countries that I kind of skipped are countries next to uh, refugee producing countries. So obviously Turkey, Pakistan, South Africa, Lebanon, you can see what's going on. But uh, China actually stays here. It, actually, it's above the United Kingdom. It's below other major Western countries, but it's here. It's a very sort of uh, interesting figure. Fact two, the majority of Chinese, the refugees into China are from Indochina. So, in fact, at the uh, 2015, the majority comes, came from Vietnam, Red, Somalia, Nigeria, Iraq, uh, Liberia, and others. So, these Vietnam refugees really boosted the figures. Okay. So, those are the key sort of um, starting points, I guess. They're very interesting in itself. Now, um, Okay, so um, empirical case one. How did China respond to refugee regimes? In fact, it was quite early stage. In 1979, um, UNHCR Beijing office was created. And then China actually ratified refugee treaty and convention in 1982. Think about it. China was a, had, had a cultural revolution until 76. And then 78, opening up policy. And China was just uh, 79, of course, US-China uh, normalization. Pretty much after that, China ratified refugee treaty and convention. Now, the kind of impression we might have about China's human rights policy, this is quite an early stage that it's actually ratified those key convention and um, uh, protocol. And it actually jumps in terms of chronologically uh, but then last year, Xi Jinping promised 100 million US dollars humanitarian aid to refugees at the UN Refugee Summit. So this is a major, these are the major sort of features of China's relations with refugee regimes. Why did China do that? First of all, it's a necessity. As I said, the majority of China, uh, refugees into China came from Vietnam. So China needed to find out the kind of uh, nuts and bolts of how you accept refugees. So the Inter-China refugee arrived in China in summer 1978. Pretty much afterwards, UNHCR Beijing office was created. So China needed to know um, how exactly you process refugees. And in the 80s also, uh, it was very interesting that there was a so-called international law fever. Um, that uh, after the opening up, there was one stage in Chinese history that, uh, uh, that China really wanted to be part of the international human rights regime. In fact, in 1981, China became a, a member of UN Human Rights Commission. So China wanted to uh, ratify many uh, human rights uh, conventions, including uh, refugee treaty and convention. Now, international relations experts look at this and say, well, look, this is a kind of process of China's socialization into international institutions. The, uh, some of you might be uh, familiar with Alastair Ian Johnston's work on social states. But actually, it's really interesting. Oftentimes, uh, constructivists in international relations um, sort of amalgamate socialization and internalization. There's one thing to socialize yourself into international institutions, but there is quite another process that you actually internalize the values and norms into your domestic system. So what China did was to be part of this international regime, 
But then China hasn't created any domestic law to define what refugees are and how refugees can be accepted, etc. So it stays at the international law level rather than domestic law. And this, this applies to many countries, not just China, but um, not internationalization. This sort of thing, the 100 million US dollars um, contribution to uh, refugees, great. And uh, maybe I'm a bit sarcastic here, but I can see some kind of uh, nimbism here. China does not want to accept many African and Middle Eastern refugees, but then we're happy to contribute money. Yeah, not, not in my backyard, but I'm happy to contribute money. So um, I'm, I may be a bit sarcastic, but that, 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 those are the kind of why elements. I've got to be a bit quick. So there are three more empirical cases. First one is the case of uh, in the China ret returnees. Now, as I said, China doesn't recognize a uh, uh, refugee as the official language. It's returnees. Okay. What happened was that, of course, the end of Vietnam War and reunification of Vietnam meant that um, those ethnic Chinese, in, particularly in the south part of Vietnam, were in danger because they were um, sorry, they were regarded as bourgeois merchant, and uh, there was some restriction um, placed upon uh, against them. And then, um, just to sort of skip the details. Basically, all these wars, Cambodian Vietnam War and Sino Vietnamese War, meant that China and Vietnam stopped any sort of diplomatic relations. And also, there was a rumor just before Sino Vietnamese War that when the war had to, uh, would take place, ethnic Chinese will be massacred. And we don't really know who put that rumor, but then the rumor was so huge that many. Um, Vietnam, many Ch ethnic Chinese who lived in Vietnam had to flee the country. So many uh, put, uh, got on the boat, and then many died. But then they arrived, those who arrived in China, roughly this number, uh, arrived in China. And China welcomed those Vietnamese refugees. Well, actually, they, uh, ethnic Chinese, but Vietnamese refugees. And like, I say welcome because uh, I read uh, some of the uh, um, uh, sort of a note from a Cantonese uh, local government official. He said, um, party secretary actually, stated a directive from the government came quickly down to us to take the refugees. They came here with nothing at all. We issued them uh, farm tools and even their bowls and chopsticks. And uh, so uh, other parts of the um, his diary actually said that uh, we had no idea what to do with them. But then the central government uh, ordered us to accept them. We just accepted them and they distributed chopsticks. So um, that's a really interesting sort of welcoming uh, attitude. Why did that happen? One of the most important things is that the Vietnam was an enemy. And ethnic Chinese were, even though it might have been rumor, might get massacred. So, and some South, uh, the ethnic Chinese in South Vietnam actually had Chinese nationality because China and South Vietnam didn't have diplomatic relations, so they couldn't just get the Chinese national, uh, or Vietnamese nationality. So, so all these two main reasons um, caused this sort of welcoming or, um, sort of attitude of the Chinese government. Just bear with me with two more empirical cases. Um, North Korea. Okay, so as I said, they are called SKPs. They actually have a border area affairs agreement in which Chinese government needs to repatriate North Korean SKPs back to North Korea. And also, that agreement allows North Korean um, agencies to come into Chinese territory and hunt for them. And the figures are really difficult. I don't know exactly how many North Korean SKPs are in China. Varies this much. But then what we know is that the Chinese government repatriates those who, uh, that they arrest. And also uh, they start to arrest. They started in about 1998. Arrested humanitarian workers, particularly from South Korea, who tried to help North Korean SKPs. Why do they do that? China DPR relations. They wanted to 
um, sort of res uh, res uh, respect the relations, uh, and so sort of respect the relations, and therefore they needed to make sure that each other that they understand each other and keep the promise to each other. Also, loose border controls. Despite the kind of agreement, there are still lots of refugees coming into China, and that's because of loose border control. I looked at many government documents and some media analysis in, in the past, in the 1990s and 2000s. Surprisingly, I didn't see any words about social stability which is quite surprising. I thought that was the main reason, but according to the, uh, all the government documents relating to North Korean escapees, they didn't really talk about um, social stability as the reason why they couldn't do it. They talk about DPRP relations. But then, of course, right now, if uh, um, any sort of uh, emergency happens, stability, of course, matters quite a lot. So that's a kind of changing element. Final example, um, okay, so very Myanmar people are called Vietnamese, and they're always going back and forth between Chinese territory and, and uh, Myanmar territory. So you can see uh, some from Kokan, which is the, uh, basically just to see the map. This is the Kokan, uh, and this is the Kachin state. So refugees come from this bit into China, and this bit from, uh, to China. Now, um, I need to skip all this, but basically they are going back and forth, and lots coming into China and lots coming um, sort of rejected by the Myanmar government. Why? Uh, the Chinese government explained that it's a request from the Myanmar government. That uh, the Myanmar government, for example, this one happened early this year, said that um, they, those, those refugees were fighters. We don't want the fight in the Chinese territory, and therefore don't accept those refugees into Chinese territory because we are expanding or uh, exporting fights into Chinese territory. That was the request from the Myanmar government and China uh, well, didn't kick them out but rejected the proposal, didn't let them in. But at the same time, Chinese Red Cross go there and that was the first time the Chinese Red Cross actually delivered humanitarian assistance to Myanmar people. Chinese Red Cross is pretty much a state organ. So they do some humanitarian um, uh, sort of um, assistance because war is taking place. You might think, why this is not happening to North Korea? Well, North Korea, there is no war at the moment. Whereas Myanmar, there is a clear war happening and therefore humanitarian uh, assistance has to be done. Loose border control is another case. So I'm sorry that I'm rushing, but this is the kind of uh, summary thing. Uh, I can't really you know, explain everything, but then you can see this is pretty much filled bilateral relations. China's relations with neighboring countries is the major consideration. In this case, because China and Vietnam were fighting, this became the reason why China had to accept Vietnamese refugee. Whereas this one, because of the relations that China has with DPRK and Myanmar, they are refu Chinese is refusing refugees. So it works in a different way, but then you can see the major reasons stays somewhere around here. Whereas if you look at the Western, UK and US policy, cultural, economic and security are the major reasons. So that's why I say this is state-led anti-globalism, not really culture and economic security, so people-led. It's more about state-led. So, just a final concluding remark. Sorry, I'm so flashing. Um, China's refugee policies have been determined by its relations with bordering states rather than social stability or ethnic factor. Economic and social security is not source of China's anti-globalism. China's anti-globalism is state-led rather than society-led. So it's pretty much a work in progress, but I really look forward to your comments, and thank you very much for your attention. Mostly because of the limitation of time, we should move to Professor Tsao now. Uh, we'll come up to the audience, please.
sister or brother universities for at least the two, two decades, or if not more than that. Uh, we just signed a joint degree uh, program. And before, we also have two degree program uh, with the Michigan University. And, uh, uh, and this is a, a very good occasion uh, to have this joint uh, uh, project here uh, and organized by U.S. Japan uh, Research Institution. I'm also pleased to see my colleague, uh, Kuniko uh, Ashizawa Sensei, also here. Uh, maybe I'm not sure whether there are other EU professor or students, uh, but uh, we. Uh, uh, I'm very pleased to hear. Uh, uh, Hilano Sansai uh, gave very clear presentation with this uh, overall framework of globalism or anti-globalism. Uh, I myself, uh, I, I have been working on Chinese foreign policy and not necessarily on this refugee policy. Uh, actually, it was assigned by Nakatsuji Sansai say, uh, for uh, this as well. So in a way, it's a complementary with Hilano Sensei and uh, provide a kind of uh, background uh, for this uh, important topic. Uh, let me just uh, uh, go over uh, what I would say that uh, in, in, in addition to Hilano Sensei already mentioned uh, six perspectives or eight perspectives, uh, for me, I basically just go through uh, from three what I call the approaches uh, to this idea. One called history embedded uh, with uh, refugee policy, and the second uh, perspective is a national interest driven, and uh, thirdly uh, is responsibility concern. Uh, so, uh, what I would argue that. China's refugee policy pretty much uh, with those three elements, what I call is an interplay or mixed factors. Uh, so let me just move on. Uh, history embedded very much to do uh, with the idea of uh, so-called Chinese society. Uh, it's just like other East Asian societies, uh, including such as Japan or Korea, uh, each society actually is very much homogeneous. Uh, in Chinese case, 91.5% uh, of the Chinese population is a Han. And others, uh, like uh, Tibetans, Koreans, uh, Mongols, uh, Uyghurs, uh, altogether, I guess, less than 10%. Uh, so here, uh, so with this kind of idea, uh, with consideration, later we will talk about uh, why China regarded uh, some related to social stability issue and others. Uh, uh, Nakasuji Sansai early just talk about uh, we may put that into a comparative perspective. If we look at all East Asian societies, uh, Japanese, Koreans, Chinese, I guess very much also put into consideration of this social stability and homogeneous uh, ideas in, in all those societies, which related to poli uh, refugee policy issues. Uh, Early time, if we look at here, uh, China has a long tradition. Uh, if we always, whenever we talk about China, we always refer to 2000, 1000 years ago, like Han Dynasty or Tang Dynasty. Uh, in that kind of uh, ideas, if you look at here, even today, one by one Zhou policy is also something to do uh, with how much China opened its door. And then from, actually, we trace back to those early times, we will see uh, the interaction between China 
and the, including current uh, European and the Middle East societies. So at that time, uh, China basically interact with merchants uh, for trade purpose with not only uh, the surrounding countries, but also Middle East, North Africa, and the West. Uh, it really is, uh, I, I guess that's a pretty large uh, scope. That's the foundation for today's One Belt, One Road policy. Uh, however, uh, China had a isolated period a closed door period. If you look at it here, uh, starting from Ming Dynasty uh, all the way to Mao era and then to the current until Deng Xiaoping, 1978. So China closed door for a long period. And here, Deng Xiaoping, uh, that is had the very meaning of Kai Ge Kai Fang is open to the West and open to the world. Uh, so, so in a way, uh, that's a kind of starting point uh, for globalization. Uh, if we look at it. so that we have to attribute that policy with a Deng era, and that particular openness, and also. Uh, we may consider relevant to today's refugee policy as well. However, I guess when we look at the refugee policy, it's also something to do with overall environment. If China is closed, then the refugee policy also closed. And then China is open, there would be an impact on those questions. Reasons to accept refugees. If we look at it, there are not many, many reasons. Humanitarian efforts, economically beneficial, labor shortage, if we look at it, it's not only China. If we look at every country, and the social, moral, uh, 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 moral issue, and responsibility as well. Uh, so those issues, however, uh, we have to consider, like I just mentioned, history embedded issues. Uh, if we look at here, there are so many different ideas and in comparison with the European countries as well. Therefore, like uh, Helena says, I, I just mentioned, uh, uh, there are many different, particularly the Vietnamese, uh, from Vietnam. Uh, so that's actually, if you look at the number, uh, more than 300,000 uh, but the question, if you look at it, that's known as a bold people, uh, then with uh, North Korea refugees uh, and Indonesia, that's another issue. Uh, uh, but that's a different case. And then finally, Myanmar. Uh, so those issues, uh, but one of the questions, uh, the difference between uh, the, uh, refugees from Vietnam and the refugees from Korea, uh, is, is we all understand, uh, is the from Vietnam basically uh, overwhelmingly the ethnic Chinese. Uh, they regard it as so-called returning to China uh, with those issues. Whereas North Korea refugee, there is no such concept of returning to motherland. So that's a, a, a difference between, uh, between those questions. Uh, and now, if we continue to look at uh, the national interest-driven approach, uh, that approach uh, very much to do with uh, social stability issue. Uh, if we look at here, uh, the uh, the Middle East uh, area, and uh, the basic concern. Why China has such concern? Instability. Uh, therefore, we have to look at this area, uh, that is Xinjiang. Uh, Xinjiang is pretty much 
uh, Uyghur and uh, Muslim. Uh, actually, uh, Muslim population in China is, is a huge number. Uh, and here, if you look at Xinjiang, and if you look at other area, uh, then uh, that particular area, uh, and there is an idea of uh, uh, East Turkestan independence movement. Uh, even today, uh, that area considered is instable. So stability, uh, that's very much to do with national interest. Because, look at here. Uh, uh, Xinjiang, if, if, if you look at here, that's called the East Turkestan. So that area, uh, it, it's, it's uh, uh, if we look at the U.S.-China relations, China pushed Washington to recognize that East Turkestan independent movement is a part of terrorism. Uh, so, uh, so that is a very much to do, not necessarily anti-globalism, but rather uh, to put that into anti-terrorism, and and also uh, those area, those uh, related to China's its own minority group, and the Xinjiang issue. Uh, so that's why there are uh, different policy. Uh, if you look at why accepting Vietnamese, uh, the Vietnam refugee, and why refuse very much from Middle East, uh, that is because uh, this national interest driven policy. Uh, and Middle East, uh, specifically, uh, that China opposed uh, that with Syria and does not feel responsible all those refugees, uh, if you look at the most recent cases. Uh, and uh, the third approach, however, is that uh, what I call is responsibility concern. Or in other words, uh, China also tried to uh, demonstrate its willingness uh, to go with international, uh, like international law and others and try to uh, another word to put this approach is what I call is a co-management. Is a co-manage with other major powers. If you look at here, and China basically um, with China rising, and if you look at here, uh, is gradually China uh, has become a global power. Therefore, uh, China must take responsibility. And that is also look at the, the activities here. Uh, therefore, uh, it, it is early, we, we already talked about 300,000 uh, refugees from Indochina, right? Uh, primarily from Vietnam. So uh, that's like uh, uh, Miwa Sang just early mentioned the China rank uh, 21, right? Uh, it's it's not really, but in that case, actually, it's not necessarily uh, classified as a refugee. Many of them actually is ethnic or Chinese. Uh, they return to China. Uh, that Indochina, the Vietnamese, uh, vast majority. However, uh, if you look at the Korean issue uh, and uh, the uh, Han Chinese. That's pretty much uh, Han Chinese there. And also there are Koreans as well. That's another issue. We talk about and those Koreans, uh, they are also from Japan, uh, 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 Myanmar, and Vietnam. And China has accepted refugees from East and Southeast Asian countries, but not accept refugees from India. So that's another question. Uh, and pockets versus borders, China's willing to provide money, right? Mm -hmm. uh, earlier we mentioned the, whether it's one, the, the one, 100 million or 700 million yuan is the equivalent of those 
uh, dollars. Uh, so uh, willing to provide some funding for United Nations sponsors refugee activities, <coughs> but not open to its borders for Middle East. I guess that's another point. So in other words, uh, we do see a different consideration. Uh, because China has to consider its international image. Uh, therefore, it's willing to provide funding to support. But at the same time, we now want uh, refugee issue jeopardize its own uh, uh, st social stability. Uh, this kind of international responsibility, uh, according to like Foreign Minister Wang Yi, for example, uh, arguing that uh, refugees are not migrants, and the displaced refugees around the world will eventually return to their own countries and rebuild their homeland. Uh, so UN Security Council on Syria issue and the political settlement process of the Syria issues should be accelerated first to create necessary conditions for the return of the refugees. So there are some contemporary uh, arguments. And I would say that uh, this policy is still unfolding uh, because this large, large uh, scope refugee issue is relatively new. And China, uh, historically, would not need to consider this kind of a global issue unless that affects uh, their own borders. But now China is a, uh, one of the five permanent members of UN and also China itself becoming globalized. So China must uh, tackle those issues. And current status we already mentioned besides those Indochina area, there are some accounts, of course, uh, depends on different uh, time, different uh, uh, survey different uh, calculation. There are one of the uh, the numbers is called 825 from other than only 141 from Middle East and others. Uh, so uh, it's not that a lot. If we look at uh, total number, it's more than 300,000. But from Middle East, it's very minimal. Uh, so that's the. North Korea, that definitely is a huge issue and a potential. If you look at this picture, I'm not sure whether you can guess what this picture from. It's actually this picture from Shenyang uh, a few years back uh, is a uh, uh, North Korean refugee try to uh, broke into Japanese consulate. Uh, uh, and what a year? The, uh, I guess about 2002. 20, 2002. 2002. Uh, I was a visiting scholar at that time at the Niigata University, uh, more than about uh, And uh, that all of a sudden, this happened. And I was interviewed. Uh, so uh, by, 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 by that particular, at, at that time, enormous uh, denouncement actually from Japan, from Gamushu. They said, why, why the uh, those arms police people stop, stopped North Korean refugees to enter Japanese consulate? Okay, so they never got yeah. they never got into the consulate then. Because those the Chinese, okay. uh, Chinese arms police yeah. uh, uh, okay. stop those North Korea. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, they never got into. Uh, but that became a, a diplomatic uh, 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 battle between China and Japan. Actually, Japan was uh, e essentially not part of this at, at the beginning. But then because this is a, and, and some Japanese news News media uh, called this as an invasion of the Japanese territory because you know that's the uh, uh, consulate. 
But then the Chinese argument is that we would like to safeguard the Japanese. If, if we don't let our uh, armed police stop those refugees, what would happen? And the refugees would uh, flood into a uh, Japanese consulate, and that would be is, is virtually impossible to handle. So that's a, so what I'm saying here, uh, that kind of issue uh, may become a, uh, uh, a diplomatic uh, argument uh, as well. Uh, but uh, uh, here, uh, the idea, uh, the basic concern of the North Korea issue uh, is U.S.-North Korea relations, uh, uh, like North Korea uh, nuclear issue, and uh, most, most uh, currently, actually, uh, is uh, Donald Trump versus Xi Jinping. Uh, actually, I'm going to give another uh, lecture next month at American University, specifically dealing with how Xi Jinping deal with uh, Donald Trump in, in, uh, regarding North Korea issue, but that's pretty much nuclear issue, not refugee. But refugee issue is a part of concerns. It's a part of concerns. That is, we uh, into uh, Manchuria area, therefore instability. And we now know that uh, uh, there are tight control uh, uh, with already uh, 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 repatriated, uh, but the policy sometimes tight, sometimes loose. It depends on the circumstances, it depends on different times. Therefore, uh, like early, uh, Mima san gave the uh, number, uh, it is, you know, it's, it's no way to know uh, exactly you know, how many North Korea uh, refugees. Uh, but China uh, is very much debate internally about how to handle this issue. Uh, the North Korea issue, uh, uh, I would say that uh, uh, currently uh, is a huge uh, debate within uh, Chinese foreign policy and including the refugee. And one of the suggestions, for example, uh, if you look at the past week, there has been debate between two schools of thought openly uh, from Beijing. Uh, one argument from, for example, Professor Jia, Jia Qingguo, of school, Dean of School of International Affairs at the Peking University, basically, his argument is that China should be prepared for a collapse of the North Korean regime together with Washington and the Seoul, including build up uh, refugee camps uh, along North Korea border with China. And another school of thought attack Professor Jia saying that uh, your argument basically uh, is uh, along the line of Washington and jeopardize China's national interest. So it's, so the argument still continues <coughs> the debate, including how to handle. But this kind of issue with North Korea, certainly beyond the refugee issue, because there are also some nuclear uh, issue and the, the entire Manchuria uh, might be jeopardized. So those are uh, uh, things different. Uh, with time concerns, let me just move to my conclusion. Uh, that is uh, the China's refugee policy. Uh, three approaches we have to consider with historical development and then once China opened up its, its, its so-called uh, open and reform, the national interest driven is very much, therefore, like social uh, and uh, political and social stability 
is one of the major concerns. And the final is responsibility concern, that is China is all international image, and since China goes abroad, a global, therefore, uh, must also take this consideration, what I call co-management approach. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tsao. Um, I don't want to confuse our discussion, but uh, if you're interested, uh, I would like to recommend you to uh, check the uh, February session of uh, uh, our university at uh, USGI. Uh, it, it was about uh, immigration. Uh, we discussed about, uh, of course, US-Mexico case in comparison with Japan. Uh, U.S. and uh, 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 the reason why I'm uh, touching upon it is that, uh, uh, as uh, Professor Hirono has mentioned, that uh, once they enter in the country, uh, whether they are uh, refugees or immigrants, uh, that the problem or the adaptation will take place uh, simultaneously. So uh, I think. Uh, uh, I, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to uh, praise myself uh, too much, but uh, we started talking about uh, anti-globalism uh, uh, by through people, uh, the immigration and refugees. Uh, the, the people, the problem people is tend to be very emotional, so that uh, it will invite uh, anti-globalism of local people. So uh, I think we uh, uh, didn't make a uh, huge mistake by uh, adopting this approach. Uh, I, I uh, uh, felt that way, especially when uh, uh, Professor Tsao had mentioned about uh, uh, Chinese mi uh, mi minor uh, uh, ethnic minority in, in uh, Western part of uh, China. And, uh, but uh, I think, uh, of course, uh, I would like to uh, conclude my uh, uh, comments uh, in, in, in a minute or so, but uh, what I have felt uh, listening to uh, two uh, very interesting, uh, uh, splendid presentations is that uh, probably China is quite similar to Japan, especially in terms of immigration. Uh, my my guess is that probably China have done, learned from Japan's policy. Japan is very restricted in terms of accepting refugees. Japan spend money but do not accept people. Okay, same thing can be said about Korea, Taiwan. And uh, all of them are in a sense kind of stem led, uh, if I may use the word of uh, Professor Hirono, a uh, state-led restricted policy, if uh, we don't call it uh, anti-globalism or anything. But as uh, Professor had, had somewhat mentioned, uh, maybe we, our future uh, uh, is not that bright if we continue this kind of policy. Uh, the, he, uh, army the scenario, he uh, depicted the army the scenario that uh, huge uh, numbers of uh, refugees from North Korea might uh, enter into China. And Japan is aging. We need foreign, foreign uh, labor, obviously. And that's what's happening already in, in uh, uh, Hong Kong, in a sense. So uh, state-led, restrictive, anti-globalist uh, policy uh, may be able to continue, I think. Uh, so much for my uh, uh, the comment. Uh, we, we still have uh, 20 minutes. Uh, fortunately, we would like to welcome uh, your questions and comments. Uh, please identify sure. yourself. Uh, I'm Ralph Winnie. I'm the director of the China program at the Eurasia Center. I have uh, two questions. First was for Mrs. Hirano. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Korean work, humanitarian workers were being arrested. Are you referring to the Korean minority within China uh, as well as South Korean humanitarian aid workers that may be there legally? Uh, I wasn't sure if you meant both or one or the other. And then the other question to Zhao. The 825 um, refugees that were admitted 
did they have some sort of special, unique skill that the Chinese were looking for in terms of who they wanted to come in? I mean, it's obviously very token, right? Because they they have, in effect, closed borders. But they must have seen something in those people that they needed, a particular skill or a skill set that they needed for a particular period of time. So that, that was my question. Thanks very much for your question. Um, yeah. uh, yes, the, uh, my source is Human Rights Watch. And okay. uh, according to that, uh, those arrested were Korean nationals rather than ethnic Koreans. Because there's I a think, K Korean minority within China that actually yeah. helps them. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So they're not necessarily divided, but, uh, but this is something that I haven't researched very well, so don't quote me on that. But okay. the, the resource that I do, did look at is the um, Korean, South Korean national who Okay. okay, are they there legally to help refugees or do they come in? <laughs> Good question. Yeah. What sort of status they have? They might have had uh, uh, NGO status, yeah. um, but they're not, I mean, in my, my previous research yeah. was about Christian NGO working in China. So they do come to China as a development NGO. Okay. And uh, some of them just stick to it. Uh, like, just, you just, you know, it's too risky to do something other than right. that. So I assume they come as an NGO status or okay. individual tourist. But right. thanks for the question. I think that's something that I should look into. Yeah, because I know a lot of Chinese around the border area will help, um, even Han, yeah. because they feel sorry for them. They remember the Cultural Revolution. They'll, they'll yeah. at least give them food, yeah. if not try and try and help. So, yeah, and yeah. um, I, I haven't seen that bit, yeah. but uh, that uh, border agreement yeah. actually. Um, allowed Chinese and North Korean agencies to arrest those who were cooperating yeah. with the uh, humanitarian uh, or refugees okay. themselves. So okay. yes, uh, they are, are under the legal yeah. target. Okay. Oh, yeah, thank you for the question. I think we can see uh, the overall number of yeah. more than 300,000 refugees, overwhelmingly, Vietnamese Chinese. Right. And those 800 or something is just from some some uh, statistical figures. Right. Uh, I don't think China's consideration is based on their skills or what. Rather, it's a case by case. Right. It's based on diplomatic relations, international image, and uh, so. Uh, and also, I, I, I have to uh, admit that I didn't really do specific okay. research about the individual cases. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I, I agree with uh, uh, KG's early argument that is uh, to accept refugee uh, and others is not necessarily the tradition right. for East Asia countries, including China, Japan, Korea. Uh, if they have labor shortage, they would have their own specific plan uh, yeah. rather than accept a refugee. And that's still, I guess, is unfolding. It is a new situation. That is how to accept the refugee on one hand, and then try to solve their own labor shortage on the other hand. I don't think that there is a fixed uh, solution yet uh, at this point. Is there any kind of asylum procedure for people, or is it pretty much, you know, uh, they send them back? Um, for the North Korea. You know, China signed yeah. uh, that international refugee, yeah. but then uh, when, uh, I mean, that agreement, uh, but then when, when, when uh, implementation, uh, I would guess is a case by case. Okay. You, you know, you can control that yeah. uh, by different cases. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Just to add to that, sorry, that okay. Okay. Um, just to add to that, um, the uh, all the businesses of who to who to be recognized as a refugee or not are done by UNHCR, not by the Chinese authority. Okay. And whether the criteria includes skills or not, I don't really know. But uh, um, those uh, refugees from Africa, uh, Somalia, Nigeria, Iraq, and Middle East, of course, Liberia, uh, were assessed not in China. Because okay. they don't arrive in China and they get surprised. Uh, they're assessed in the home country, and then when they are recognized, they are uh, you know, carried to China. So uh, that's one consideration, I guess.
Can I just say one thing about the Japan China thing? Um, I, I'm not Japan Spanish, so, so I don't really know, but I think I agree with you that um, in terms of uh, the way to contribute to refugee uh, uh, um, regime, Japan and China are pretty similar. Uh, financial contribution as the main, but actually mean is going on. But then one thing that I learned from one of my colleagues, Nanikawa Sensei, is that um, Japan actually internalized the international treaty. Um, and therefore, uh, Japan has a duty to uh, recognize, once the people are recognized as refugees, they have to live exactly in the same condition as Japanese citizens. That's what the refugee convention said. So Japan internalized it, and therefore, because of that very strict condition, Japan cannot accept many refugees. Whereas China hasn't internalized any, uh, that refugee uh, treaty, but the result is the same, still very difficult to accept many refugees. So um, internalization process is a bit different. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Oh, I'm just fine. You can hear me. Um, my name is Kikuchi, and I'm a uh, long time uh, uh, ex time staff and uh, uh, also uh, commentator on various issues. Um, the, uh, first of all, my, my uh, uh, conclusion is from what uh, Professor Zhang said, uh, Zhang said, Zhao said, that uh, 825 for a country of 1.3 billion is a uh, uh, drop in the bucket. So why are we fussing about it is one issue. Second is this 300,000 is so, as you have shown, this is a very special case. It's 300,000 ethnic Chinese who went back. Many of them came to the US also, and many of them were accepted here, and they are the prominent people here. Uh, and the, uh, I think Professor uh, Hirono, you, you mentioned that there were rumors of massacre and so forth, but uh, those were not rumors if uh, you look back a few years ago to the case of Indonesia and how the ethnic Chinese were massacred. And uh, to say that they were afraid of rumors of being uh, massacred is, is a bit, uh, how do I say, a cruel. Uh, it was a real threat. Uh, so I would like to say that. Gentlemen. Uh, Stanley Covert, uh, I'd like to broaden this out. Um, as depicted in the slide in the first presentation, the countries that received refugees were typically in a geographical location next to conflicts. Jordan gets refugees from Palestine, it still has you know, from the formation you now decades ago of Israel. Um, it has Iraq, it has Syria, it's just being swamped. Turkey has been getting a lot of refugees. I don't have to elaborate. So far, the refugees have largely been a product of these conflicts. But increasingly, there will be a problem with climate change. This is going to affect China and Japan. Where will they go? There was a recent study at Cornell that said by the end of the century, by 2100, 2 billion people, now a fifth of the world's population, could become refugees as a result of climate change. And you know, you are next to South Asia, where will they go? A lot of places, islands, where will they, even in Japan, where will they go? And, you know, to my mind, the question you're raising here with regard to China, again, should be broadened out. This is going to be a huge political problem. Thank you for your input. Uh, any, anything from ladies? Okay, um, uh, thank you. I'm at American University. I was also reading it. Quite interesting mm -hmm. presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, uh, just listening to uh, those two presentations, I just came to uh, and feel that the, one of the factors, two of you are alluding, uh, alluding to uh, as a kind of determining factor for the Chinese policy for actually 
could be, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the ethnic background of the teachings. And of course, I'm supposed to be mentioned, but somehow you didn't really um, pick up uh, uh, into your analytical frame. I'm sure there's some reason that you didn't do that. So I'm just curious that, that um, to what extent this kind of ethnic background of the refugees uh, have been important, has been important for Chinese policy. And then maybe to what extent it's going to be continually important, or there may be some kind of change in Chinese kind of achievements. Mm -hmm. like yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you uh, for all those good questions. Uh, let me just turn to the last one first. I think the background uh, is very important. Uh, it's Hilano says that uh, readily uh, classified. Uh, in, from Chinese concept, they don't necessarily consider those are refugees. They consider they are country families. And also China used to have a dual citizenship, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia. Uh, a reportedly uh, reached from uh, 30 million to 60 million, depending on how you calculate it, in Indonesia and particularly Malaysia, the Philippines, and the Vietnam, that's those are. And uh, what happened in Vietnam, uh, uh, from Chinese perspective, is rescue uh, their own ethnic Chinese, uh, rather than the refugee policy. And uh, uh, Chinese response to what happened uh, is, uh, is, is the Kikuchi Sunset mentioned massacre in Indonesia is very weak because uh, Beijing's relations with Jakarta military regime at that time uh, is close relationship. Uh, so it, it's a uh, intertwined picture between their own concern, their concern with, with so-called their own people, uh, and the diplomatic relations. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, today there are many self-examinations about what happened in Indonesia, because there are massacre, and uh, China has not responded quickly, and there are no rescue for, for, for their own ethnic Chinese people. Uh, many Indonesian refugees actually moved to the United States uh, rather than back. But with Vietnam, that's a very different picture. Uh, uh, as uh, Hilono Sansai mentioned, uh, they regarded with those returning from Vietnam, their own people. Uh, they provide housing, provide farmers to let those people settle. And as a matter of fact, uh, to prepare a war with so that's a diplomatic relations as well. So uh, I guess the question here uh, is uh, the concept of refugee uh, still relatively new. Uh, you know, remember I referred to all the way to a Han Dynasty, Tang Dynasty. They don't have that refugee. They did not. Uh, rather uh, regarded a uh, you know there is a concept like Tianxia. Right? As long as you come to China, it's fine. It, it's, there are no, the border system is only recent uh, times. Uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, China is uh, still uh, in a, a learning process uh, how to deal with this contemporary, uh, 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 like uh, early we all talked about socialization process, international law. And all of that, I guess, is relatively new. And China tried to learn and they tried to adopt a weak international standard. Having said that, there are still concrete problems, such as uh, social order, stability, uh, national interest. And then you can consider early question about uh, the skilled laborers. Uh, that maybe would be a combination of future consideration, but I would say that consideration is still a relatively low. And uh, finally, Stanley talked about future uh, 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 scenario of climate change. 
I guess that issue facing everybody and not facing you is to look at what happened in Florida or Texas and uh, China, same thing. And particularly with Japan. What would do? Uh, you know, earthquake, tsunami, and others. Uh, so those really need international collaboration. Uh, it's not only a refugee issue. It's just a survival of a human being. So I guess those all need to have a, a, a what I call a joint effort, a co-management to solve all those issues. Thanks very much for the brilliant questions and comments. Um, the, uh, where shall I go? Um, okay, again, start from the, uh, the final question. Um, yes, I did include uh, ethnic Chinese as one of the analytical frameworks, but you're right that I didn't really make it clear that, that what happens to that uh, decision making. So you're right that in terms of Indochina, yes, ethnic element was really important. But then what's really interesting is Myanmar. The Kokan refugees were actually, are actually Han Chinese. So why is China not accepting them? So what, what, what differentiates the two is that um, really China's bilateral relations, and there comes the, my argument, that even though Han Chinese are uh, refugees from Myanmar, that doesn't satisfy the sort of criteria, if there is any criteria at all. Um, you know, it's not enough reason why China accepts or not accepts refugees. Um, and the reason China doesn't accept Kokan or, or so accepted some, but didn't accept, for example, the final 4,000 refugees from Kokan this year was precisely because of the Myanmar government's request. So ethnic background is not the determinant here. It's, it also changes based on um, so case by case. So yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, climate change, absolutely brilliant point. I, in my estimate, within China, the discussion about refugees, climate change refugees, is, is, remains academic at the moment. It's not really policy discussion. There is a political and, and a legal development at the moment that the Chinese government is trying to develop a law, internal law, um, about refugees. But I haven't really come across the it, it's discussion that that discussion, the legal discussion, is actually taking this into consideration. So absolutely important point. Thanks very much for pointing that out. Uh, rumors, real threat, brilliant point. Um, I do need to look into that more deeply. Yes. But yeah, the fact that um, that happened in Indonesia um, meant that it was going to happen in Vietnam. I don't know, I need to look for more evidence uh, to say it was a real threat. So yeah, but thanks for the suggestion. Um, finally, um, 800 refugees, are, um, so in terms of number, it's not that big. One of the things that we really need to be careful is the UNHCR's uh, figures. Those figures are only those who are recognized by the UNHCR as refugees. So dismiss everyone from Myanmar, dismiss everyone from North Korea. So, um, Yes, the, uh, I think the uh, refugee, number of refugees from the Middle East and Africa are indeed very small, but then it, that figure dismisses, does a lot of magic about what we think about refugee issues. It doesn't reflect the reality of what we think as refugee issues. Thanks very much. Thank you for your attention participation. I, I, I guess that we still have some more questions, but uh, unfortunately time is up. Uh, we have to close uh, this session. Uh, please join me to oppose to uh, splendid uh, presenters today.